Good morning Westview and welcome to worship. A very happy Mother's Day to all the mothers and others who fulfill that role in our lives. We appreciate you. A heartfelt thank you to everyone who supported our flood relief drive for the victims of the recent floods in KwaZulu-Natal. Your help really did make a difference. Technology is an amazing gift which can open a world of opportunities to connect, work, play, learn and more. But our tech can also leave us distracted, depressed, confused, even weary. So join us for Screen Sanity, our new preaching series, which starts on the 22nd of May. Screen Sanity, living well with your devices. Westview will be hosting sound desk training in the morning at Westview for anybody who's wanting to become a soundy volunteer or to just brush up on your current skills. If you're unsure because you think it might be too technical, please feel free to come and give it a try. For more information, Please contact James at the church office. Greetings, friends, and welcome to worship. Uh, we continue with our tithe month series as we are reflecting on the seven biblical principles for giving. And so as a way to gather our minds and our thoughts as we come before God in worship, allow me to read for us from Psalm 100, and I'm going to read from the message version of the Bible. On your feet now, applaud God, bring a gift of lotter, sing yourselves into his presence. Know this, God is God, God he made us, we didn't make him. We are his people, his well-tended sheep. Enter with the password, thank you. Make yourselves at home, talking praise, thank him, worship him. For God is sheer beauty, all generous in love, loyal always and ever. Let us come now before this wonderful God as we offer our worship to him.
utterly loving God. Utterly, utterly loving God. We praise your unfailing presence and the power of your name. Name above all names. That we have the boldness to approach or even speak your name is a kindness we enjoy because we are yours. Your love for us knows no boundaries. And for that we are filled with gratitude. Filled with gratitude because at the very core of our beings, we hear that you love us in spite of our lack of depth. You see beyond all of that and you call us still whispering that we are born in love, by love, for love. Even when we feel that we let you down, we fail to be your faithful, you remain faithful. When we speak in a manner that is not helpful or loving, or we shy away from your truth, forgive us, Lord. It's not easy being human. You know that. And yet, knowing the deepest part of us, you call us out upon the waters, trusting that we will remain faithful to what you taught us and are teaching us on a daily basis. We thank you, God, for never letting us go. We pray that in this season of resurrection and of your comforting spirit, our closest friend, our conscience, that you would lead us to places that challenge our comfort. What often challenges our comfort is something that you should be able to understand more than anybody else. It's something that should be second nature to us, but it's not. Loving our neighbor, loving the people in our lives who annoy us, practicing kindness, patience, mercy, giving, all of the things that don't come naturally to us, but that you require of us as your servants. When you taught us to pray, every word we utter in that prayer can be uttered in jest or just as something we learnt off by heart at school. We pray this prayer, Lord, with feeling, with intention. We love you. Amen. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. When we give, we place our hearts and lives, everything we have and everything we are, in God's hands. And we open ourselves to God's presence and spirit a little more. Westview's banking details are on the screen. You can use them to make your offering now or wait for the end of the video. Let's offer our whole selves to God through this generous act of giving. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that we have these gifts to give to you. Thank you that you have first given them to us. I pray, Lord, that we would joyfully be able to give you more and more. And I thank you, Lord, that that which we have brought to you will be used to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for faithful servants such as Hazel Clark, people who spend their lives uh, in your honor, people who save you. Lord, we pray this day for our dear mother, Hazel, as she has moved into the Cape. We pray, Lord, that as she settles down in that part of the world, that you might continue to be with her. And Lord, as we pray for Hazel, we want to give you thanks for her faithfulness in following you. We want to thank you for the ministry that she provided while she was still with us here at Westview being part of the prayer ministry for so many years, praying and interceding for many of us. And we know, Lord, that even now as she goes into that part of the world, she will continue with this ministry. And so, Lord, we just want to pray that as she finds ways to settle in that part of the world, that you might just continue to be with her, continue to bless her, Bless her children. We pray, Lord, for the time that she's going to spend that side with her family to be a blessed time, a time that is marked with all of your goodness, your love, as well as your graces. And we ask for all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, friends, we have two scripture readings for our message 
and they both come to us from the Old Testament. And I'm going to start with the Psalm reading. So we read together from Psalm 24, reading only the first two verses. And I read from the New International Version. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. And then our second reading from 1 Chronicles, we read from chapter 21, reading from verse 18 to verse 25. Then the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arwana the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that Gad had spoken in the name of the Lord. While Arwana was threshing wheat, he turned and saw the angel. His four sons who were with him hid themselves. Then David approached, and when Arwana looked and saw him, he left the threshing floor and bowed down before David with his face on the ground. David said to him, Let me have the sight of your threshing floor so I can build an altar to the Lord, that the plague on the people may be stopped. Sell it to me at the full price. Arwana said to David, Take it. Let my Lord the king do whatever pleases him. Look, I will give the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing sledges for the wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give all this. But King David replied to Arwana, No, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, or sacrifice a burnt offering that cost me nothing. So David paid Arwana 600 shekels of gold for the site, and this is the word of God. Thanks be to God for this word. Amen. Friends, over the past few weeks, we have been reflecting together on the theme of life giving. And as we have been reflecting on this theme, we have been exploring seven biblical principles for giving. Through this series, we have seen that you and I long for our lives to embody a generosity that brings us freedom and joy, a generosity that impacts the world with God's light and life. And so today, as we conclude this particular series, we are going to reflect on the last two out of the seven biblical principles for giving, and those two are stewardship as well as sacrificial giving. Now, when we think about stewardship, we go to Psalm 24 and verses 1 and 2 establish for us the principle of stewardship. When we give, uh, according to Psalm 24, when we give, we are actually returning to God a portion of that which already belongs to God. And so the belief that you and I as Christians and as followers of Christ are stewards, not owners uh, of the things that we might possess, releases us from living the lie that we are what we own. Stewardship then, of which the giving of money and possessions is a part of, is actually a Christian activity just as important as worship, prayer, Bible study, mission work, as well as evangelism. But then what is stewardship and what does it mean? Uh, what is this whole concept of stewardship and what does it mean? The word steward could mean entrustment or a responsible servant. Jesus viewed the steward or a steward as the willing custodian of all that God has entrusted to them. 
And so one might ask then, just what is it that God has entrusted to us? And so to answer that question, we probably need a, a, brief, a brief exploration uh, uh, to carefully see what is it that God has done for us and that which God has given to us so that we can get a perspective of the immensity of God's generosity towards us, of God's grace, as well as God's love towards us. And so only when we fully understand what God has done for us and what scripture says on this subject can we really respond in appropriate spiritual as well as practical ways. And so let us briefly then reflect on the scope of stewardship. And as we talk about stewardship, we can talk about a number of things that God entrusts upon us as God's people, as followers of Christ. We can think about the stewardship of God's weight. We can think about the stewardship of God's people. We can think about the stewardship of time and all other things that are gifts that God gives to us uh, in our lives. But for the purposes of this message, I want to just focus on the stewardship of money, possessions, as well as material resources. And so what does the Bible then say about money or possessions? Psalm 24 verse 1 states that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. In the book of Haggai, God tells the people that the silver is mine and the gold is mine. Likewise, in Deuteronomy 8 verse 18, God says, But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so then the first principle then in our understanding of stewardship, especially as we reflect around the stewardship of money, possessions and material resources. It is that it is God who owns all the money, all the resources that we have. And if you go into the book of Deuteronomy, we will also acknowledge that it is actually God who gives us the ability to produce wealth. And so that is the first thing that we need to take note of as we reflect on stewardship. But again, you and I know that sadly, money and possessions often have a very bad effect and they, they make us forget God or they become replacement uh, things. Uh, they become things in our lives that might replace God. They have the potential to become God for us. In other words, our pursuit of money, possession, and all the material resources can turn into some God for most of us. And so we need then to begin by acknowledging uh, that uh, all these resources are a gift from God. You see, when we do that, we speak against the lie that says we are what we own. Because in our understanding then, we actually proclaim that we don't even own these things that we have, these resources that are part of our lives, but that all these resources belong to God. And so then, we, we note that money can have a bad effect on us and it can make us forget God or it can make us to become complacent and greedy. And so we can easily put our trust in money or we can use it for luxurious living. We can produce weapons of destruction or even harmful products uh, that can be used to manipulate others. But we can also use money to manipulate others. And so then, this is why then in Christian teaching over the years, we have this literature that seems to suggest to us 
that money is often the source of sinful living. But that is a debate for another day. That is not what I want to talk to us about this morning. I think for us, as we talk about stewardship, the, the, the lesson there for us is that resources are a gift that come from God. As Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, including the resources that we are called to be custodians of. And so then Jesus cautions in Luke chapter 9, verses 24 to 25. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? And so when things are going well, we often take credit for our prosperity and we become proud that our own hard work and cleverness has made us comfortable. It is easy for most of us to get busy accumulating wealth or doing things that we ignore God. But the, the notion of stewardship reminds us that it is God who gives us everything, that it is God who asks us to manage everything for God. And then I want then to try to ask and maybe respond to the question, what then should be our attitude as Christians towards possessions. If we know that possessions, money and resources can become a source for sinful living, how are we, how are you and I to relate with wealth, money and possessions? And I want to suggest the following things in terms of what our attitude should be towards possessions. I think when we look at scripture, one of the things that we cannot deny is that firstly, in scripture, we are encouraged to work hard. Scripture encourages us to work hard, to happily accept gifts, to make wise investments so as to receive interest and to save for a rainy day. Scripture says to us, a wise man saves for the future but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. And so the whole idea and principle of accumulating wealth is not something that is against our teachings and it is not against scripture. And so one of the attitudes then that we need to have in relation to possessions is that we do need to work hard, we need to be smart, we need to invest, uh, but also we need to give others. In other ways, we need to share. And so the second principle is that we need to plan for the future uh, with responsible self-control, with responsible self-control to be able to plan for the future. And in the book of Proverbs, it says that by wisdom a house is built and through understanding it is established. Through knowledge its rooms are filled with rare treasures. And so then, true biblical stewardship supports the responsible management of possessions and includes giving. It supports the responsible management of possessions or material resources, but it also includes giving. And so there is no justification then for failing to give of our possessions when we can or when we have the means to do so. Living wastefully or in frivolous consumption and luxury is something that is clearly unbiblical. Now, these failures have to do with the use of things, not their possession. And so one of the principles then that comes up in our attitude towards possession is that the acquiring possession or having possessions or possessing wealth and material resources is not a problem in itself. What becomes a problem is how we use whatever it is that we have. And so then it is not wrong to have money, 
to have possessions, but it is how it is used that is the real test for those of us who are Christians and followers of Christ. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, we read, If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother or sister in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in that person? So then, my dear friends, stewardship reminds us that all creation and all things uh, that were created, including our money and our possessions, belong to God. That God has entrusted these things to us to enjoy and to be responsible stewards of them. Now, the wonderful thing is that God does not ask for all of these things back neither does God ask that it should all go to mission or to be given to the poor. And so prudent stewardship says to us, we are able to keep more than enough of these possessions for our personal use, but we need to be directed in the power of the Holy Spirit in the way in which we use our possessions. And that is what good stewardship looks like. And then the second principle that we are dealing with today as we conclude this series is the principle of sacrificial giving. It is the principle of sacrificial giving. And so the first one, stewardship, deals with the understanding that in our giving, we need to understand that we are stewards, we are people whom God entrusts resources to for God's purposes. And so our giving needs to reflect that we understand that our possessions and resources are a gift that comes from God. And then this next principle and the last one really in the principles that we have been exploring is the one of sacrificial giving. This one says to us, our giving needs to have an element of sacrifice with it. And so in that story which we read from 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 21 about David bringing an offering to God, in that story David embodies the principle of sacrificial giving. And the principle of sacrificial giving says to us that it has something to do with generosity that embodies love that will always cost the giver. And so when David then wanted to buy Arwana's land to build an altar, Arwana generously offered the land to David as a gift. He says to David, my king, you cannot pay for the land, but I want to give to you this land as a gift. But how does David respond? And this is what David teaches you and I about sacrificial giving. David responds by refusing to accept the land as a gift because he knows that his intended purpose for the land was to offer it as a sacrifice to God. And so when Arwana offers to give it to him for free, David refuses because he understands that his giving unto the Lord needs to be sacrificial. In other words, David understands that his giving needs to cost him, David, the giver, something as he offers it to God. And so we read as David responds to Arwana, he says to him, I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a bent offering that cost me nothing. I will not take for the Lord what is yours, or sacrifice a bent offering that cost me nothing. That is what sacrificial giving is. It is giving to God a gift that costs something to the giver. That is what it is. And so David wanted then to offer a sacrifice to God. And he was not going to allow Arwana's good intentions to stand in his way. He was not going to allow Arwana's 
good will to stand in his way. That is why he refuses to accept the land as a gift. Instead, he says, I want to pay for it because if it's going to be a sacrifice that I make as David, it has to cost me. It will be something that I need to pay for myself. And so then the word sacrifice, as we learn from this very brief story of David, the word sacrifice implies giving something that costs the giver. The word sacrifice implies giving something, a gift, that costs the giver. For you and I, sacrificial giving might mean giving a gift to God that costs us in terms of ourself, that costs us in terms of our time, but also that costs us in terms of our money. And so, my dear friend, to, create, to give sacrificially, to give sacrificially requires more than just a token effort or a token gift. It requires giving up something in order to give the gift that we want to give to God. And so, God wants us to give voluntarily, but God also wants our giving to mean something. And so God invites us to give to him something that is costing us something in order for us to be able to give to God. And so then giving to God what costs you nothing does not demonstrate commitment, but when we give sacrificially, the blessings that flow from the sacrifice will make the sacrifice worthwhile. And this is in line with Jesus' teaching as well. In the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 21, in the story of the widow and the mite, Jesus said, I tell you that this poor widow put in more than all others, for others offered their gifts from what they had to spare of their riches. But she, this poor widow, poor as she is, gave all she had to live on. And so that is what sacrificial giving is. And so as we conclude this uh, life-giving series, these two principles say to us, if we want our giving to be life-giving, we need to embody a generosity that is based on the principle of stewardship. Stewardship reminds you and I that all that we are, the gift that we are to the world, all the possessions that we have are all a gift that comes to us from God. And then the second principle is that of sacrificial giving. In other words, our giving even to the work of the church uh, should be giving that is sacrificial in nature. It should be giving that costs us something in order for us to be able to give to the work of God. Amen.
time together to a close, may I invite you just where you are to sit comfortably and just to become aware of the blessings that you have in your life. You might want to name a few of them. Maybe as you look around your house, you are able to see some of the blessings that you have in your life, the things that you might want to quantify as possessions, as material resources, as well, just be aware of whatever gifts that God has given to you in your own life. Now may I invite you to think about what we said in the sermon. We said that when we give, we are actually returning to God a portion of that which God already gave to us. We are giving a portion of that which already belongs to God. We have said the belief that we are stewards and not owners releases us from living the lie that we are what we own. And so may I invite you to just think of something that you can do this week in your life to remind yourself of the fact that you are not what you own. Can you think of something that you can do in the next week to remind yourself of the fact that you are not what you own. And then we also spoke uh, about sacrificial giving. David said that I will not take for the Lord what is yours, or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. And so can I invite you to spend some time thinking about your own giving and reflect on how you can make your giving more sacrificial in nature. Think about your own giving either you're giving to Westview or to the work of God's kingdom, or you're giving generally uh, to other people, other organizations, uh, to friends and family, and just think about how you can make your giving more sacrificial in nature. And so now I invite us to together say the words of blessings. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and evermore. Amen. And so dear friends, go and embody a generosity that brings you freedom, a generosity that brings you joy, a generosity that impacts the world with God's life, that impacts the world with God's life. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.